just remember, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. Welcome to A Special Place in Hell, the podcast where an aging Gen X author and a self-hating millennial activist come together to thoroughly and conclusively solve our culture war problems with our combined wit, wisdom, and most importantly, lived experience. I am Megan Daum, the aging Gen X author, <laughs> and with me is Sarah Hader, the millennial. Not, you're not self-hating. Yeah, I think we're going to... I'm not self-hating. We got to get rid of that. Yeah. You guys don't know what you're in for. We got to, we got to do something new. Lots of new stuff coming. Yeah. I think people yeah. thought that you were self-hating like personally, but you just hate your, your generational cohort. So we're going to get rid of that. Right. Make that more clear. And I'm not aging actually. So that's also not accurate. Millennial hating millennial or something. Then we need to clear up the whole thing. I'm going to be a transhumanist. It's true. As I think, I think, yeah. Trans ageist. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think that can work. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, this is a sp very special episode with guests. We're kicking off our new season with uh, some pretty remarkable guests, Syra Rao and Regina Jackson. Yes. And some of you might know who these ladies are. Um, um, Syra has a very interesting presence on Twitter and she, you know, fr frequently shows up on my timeline as um, an object of fascination, um, alarm, perhaps outrage. Um, and so, some of you might be aware of who who she who she is. But um, if they are, if they don't know who these these ladies are, Megan, what should they know? The audience should know that Syra ran for Congress, actually, in her district in Colorado. Uh, that's where she met Regina. Um, it was not a successful campaign, but it elevated her profile. She met Regina and they started doing anti-racism work and they formed this enterprise called Race to Dinner, where they go to the homes of white women uh, and they uh, have dinner parties and they educate the white women about racism. Yes. Yes. And they have a new book out as well and um yeah. and and a movie that sort of accompanies this book. Yeah, the book is called the book is called White Women. Um and it's about uh you know white women tears essentially. And uh there's a documentary called Deconstructing Karen and we talk all about it. Yeah, and you should look up the 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 cover of the book cuz it has a little it has a little white tear on it. <laughs> The tear itself is white because white people only cry white. Do you cry brown tears? It's very, um, yeah, it does. <laughs> it's very literal. <laughs> the tear itself is white. Yeah. I do, actually. I, you need to educate me. I'm surprised you didn't know that. I'm not in your body, okay? How racist of you to not... I'm a white bodied person and I can't, yeah. I don't have the lived experience of being in your body. So, yeah. So, um, as it'll become clear, um, as you guys are watching this and, or listening to this, um, that uh, they didn't look us up, um, prior to <laughs> accepting the invitation and at some point in the middle. Um, so we have a, Oh yeah, which are entirely my fault. Entirely my fault. Like a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, many technical problems um, uh, throughout. Yes, there were a lot of white women tears after this recording because of my technical meltdown. In this one way, I think we can blame Megan. Yes, right. And so, so that happened. So if, throughout the interview, we had to like pause for like brief periods um, to get. Uh, the audio and video and stuff working again. And I think at some point in the middle, yeah. um, they looked us up or at least looked me up. You can sort of, we, I, I watched them. I don't know if you guys will be able to see this, but I watched them like on their phone, like looking down and like clearly looking us up um, or looking me up and then, you know, recognizing uh, who they're actually talking to. Um, and, and that's when I, I think that's when uh, Syrah, 
I think she said you were like like a Nazi. Called me a Nazi or implied that I was a Nazi. Is that a Madonna like a song? Or something. <laughs> like a Nazi. Yeah, I don't remember. I I don't remember exactly what ha- exactly how, how she phrased that, but it was um, it was uh, it was wonderful. And I actually think yeah. I, I actually give them a lot of credit for staying on and, you know, not like just walking away immediately, but like really um, is, you know, standing up and 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 fighting for what they believe in, which is, you know, um, odd, according to me um, and wrong, literally uh, speaking. I thought they were very personable. I thought they were very, very nice. And but <laughs> but they were there personable and. They were very personable. And um, I, I under in another context, I think we mm-hmm. w- all would have gotten along great. If we had not talked about race at yeah. all and we just <laughs> had talked about literally dinner, which is how it started, um, they I think they would have been great. Yeah. Um, like interesting, um, nice women. I enjoy the conversation <laughs> up until the point that it got to be. I would, I would enjoyed it even more. A little hostile. And then I still enjoyed it. Yeah. But in a different yeah. way, a different part of me enjoyed it. I enjoyed, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So it was good. I think um, you guys will like it. Um, and it kind of ends a little abruptly because Syrah has to leave. Um, so you'll note that too. But I think you'll enjoy yeah. um, what goes on and uh, and uh, watching the, the sparks fly. And just to be clear, two things. The the title of the book is White Women, Everything You Already Know About Your Own Racism and How to Do Better. Uh, and uh, I just want to say, we don't, even though the um, the interview has these technical problems and gets cut off here and there, the substance of the conversation is completely intact. There was nothing that got edited out that changed the meaning of anything anybody was saying or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they held up their own Um uh, and I think you guys will you guys will agree that it was an interesting conversation. Syra Rao and Regina Jackson. No, I wanted to ask whether anyone finishes their dinner because it just seems to me. I guess you have two hours to do it, so that's a long time. It is. Yeah, and you get through it. And the hosts set up the dinner. The hosts um, get everything together, and you don't have to get you know. So how do you? get the word out for these dinners? Like, is, is this work done by the host? We're, we're on social media. So we have all kinds of, you know, sites. We have a website, race to um, where people can sign up. And then we have our, um, white woman who coordinates the dinners with the hosts, our resident white woman. So the host will find the people to come to her dinner. And if our resident white woman has people's names in the area that want to attend the dinner, she will share that with the host so the host can reach out to them and include them if they want to be included. So, you know, we keep lists of people in different locations so that if we need to come up with a person, we can. And um, pretty excitingly, um, since our book and movie came out, um, book came out on November 1st, movie came out on Thanksgiving Day, American Thanksgiving Day. We're doing four set dinners a year now, and they've all sold out already. So I think for 2023, we have one in Austin, Texas, somewhere one somewhere in Florida, one in LA, and one in Denver. Um, so that's our, it's already like taken care of. And I think all of those have already been filled. Wow. And how big are they? What's the max head count? Uh, we do a maximum, I'm sorry, we do a maximum of eight women at the dinner and then myself and Syrah, a total of 10 people. What we found, we've tried to do a couple with a little more people and it gets to, you know, where, where you can't really handle it. So we keep it small and intimate. So it's, so intimate is an interesting word. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it is intimate. It would be hard if it was like a big, huge yeah, that would get, I would think that that would be hard to manage. But why did yeah. you start, have you had big groups before? Yeah, I mean, that happened by accident. And in fact, it's funny, the one who um, accidentally did that is Lisa Bond, our resident white woman. Um, that's how we met Lisa, actually. She hosted a dinner in Chicago a couple years ago and ended up being like, I don't know, 15, 20 people. And it was just too much, not 
Yeah, no, I mean, the whole the, the whole premise of this, it works because um, everybody's got to talk. And trust us when we say once they start talking, they don't want to stop talking because um, they've never had this conversation before. So they've got many decades of, of stuff pent up that they want to talk about. And so uh, we could probably even go smaller and get through the two hours really, you know, easily and yeah. quickly. Okay. And what's the like goal at the end of a dinner? Like, what are you hoping to, when do you know that this dinner has been successful and what's an indication that it hasn't been successful? Well, I think there's a couple of things that happen. Um, And Syra and I have different goals. My goal is to have white people, okay, open their mouths when they see people of color being harmed, denigrated, you know, dismissed, Uh, open your mouth, okay, and say something. Quit pretending like you don't see it, that racism doesn't exist, that everything's okay. That's my hope. And generally, we will have, you know, anywhere from one to two, sometimes more, women who leave the dinner and continue the work by joining our online network, And by taking, we have an eight-week course that's taught by Lisa Bond, our resident white woman, in just whiteness. You know, and the people who want to do the work, they will sign up for that course and continue the work. Well, you know, it's it's actually now 12 months, Regina. She just changed it to the new cohorts are like a full year. Um, No, I would say our, our goals, you know, are very specific. I would say my like goal for white people in general, not at the dinners, is to start racializing yourselves, like start calling yourselves white people, start calling other white people, white people, you call us brown, black, Asian, Latina. But if you if you have trouble with the term white people, it means that you haven't put yourself on the racial structure. And you haven't put yourself in where you land on the racial structure, and you can't really start the work. So I would say that's like sort of my my general life uh, goal. But for these dinners, it's a start. I mean, this is like, this is step one, you know, nothing, it's not like things are transformed in a course of two hours. Uh, But what Regina said is exciting is there's definitely at least one or two per dinner that absolutely leaves. And we have enough years under the belt. Now we've seen um, stick with it, get other people to do dinners, get other people to uh, join the community and can, and, you know, actually start decolonizing themselves. So isn't that, I mean, a bad thing that somebody is racializing themselves. Isn't the goal to de-racialize everyone? No. Why not? That's that's what we're talking about as a colorblind society. Because it's not And what's wrong with that? It's not true because it's it's erasing um it's erasing the reality of of it's like saying that you're not gonna point out that women exist and women are inferior, you know, socially, society, society wise to men. And so if we if we're in we are in a racialized society, we are in a racialized society. We are not post race. So as, as long as we exist in a racialized society, we have to be able to racialize the people who are at the top. We do. I mean, they have to racialize themselves. Everyone else has been racialized in the society. It seems to me that that I mean that adds into the problem, right? Like long term, if you're racializing yourself, you're feel you're otherizing yourself. Um, that goes against the you know the entire enterprise of of equality, which is ultimately we we start to see what we have in common and not what we have that's different. Well, you know, uh, Sarah, they're saying that I think it's by the year uh, twenty fifty that everybody will look like you. Oh, thank God. And you won't be able to tell who's what. (laughs) And what Syra always says is, well, but then we'll come up with something different, okay? Well, it's South Africa, South Africa, right? Like you still have a a white minority ruling um, uh, black majority and a black and brown majority. Sure, Sarah, of course, in an ideal world, everyone's equal. Nobody would argue that. That's not the case. So if everybody is being racialized except for white people, that's a problem. So that's the, that's the the problem is the people who are actually, who've created the constructs of race, who benefit from these constructs of race, have taken themselves out of the structure as if they're just the default people. And all we are saying is everybody has to acknowledge, uh, you know, the power structure in order to be able to dismantle the power structure. Well, it's interesting the way you talk about it, because one group that does identify themselves as white all the time are white nationalists. Right. 
like white racists love to go around yeah. talking about white people, <laughs> this and that. So how do you square that? Well, they're not talking about white people in the way we of talk course about not. white people, okay? They're still talking about white people as the superior race, you know, smarter, faster, stronger, bigger, all of that. And what we're saying is, you know, white people just need to own up, number one, to the creation of white supremacy, number two, to dismantling white supremacy, and number three, to identifying themselves as white. And I think the the word cyber use is the default, okay? You will hear people talk about, oh, my Asian gardener, or my... um, Mexican cook or whatever, but you never hear white people talk about, well, my, my son's white friend. And that's all we're saying is if we're going to live in a racialized society, let's racialize everybody and not have a default. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, so, so let me push back on that just a little bit though, because, because it's, um, I, I hear what you're saying. And obviously that that's, it's true that, white people are the default, like the norm. But is that so much a product of some kind of, you know, deep seated ideology and not just majority minority, like dynamics that happen everywhere, right? I mean, if I grow up in India, and I, you know, I I know only other Indian people, then when I do have a friend who's Nepali or, you know, who's from Bangladesh, I would say my Nepali friend, my Bangladeshi friend. And that's not, it's not a product of me being racist or thinking myself, you know, as superior to anyone else. But it's just that that's literally the norm in the society that I'm in. And today, you know, maybe it won't be the case 50 years from now, but today, there's still a majority in this country. And is that, I mean, so I feel like there's a lot of nefariousness that's read into what are normal, that normal human, you know, majority minority dynamics everywhere. And in, in fact, they're worse in other parts of the country, like in other parts of the world, like India is a place where it's worse. Pakistan is a place where it's worse. That's where I'm familiar with. I'm Pakistani and my family's from India. And, and and the reason it's worse is because of colonization, okay? So white people went to those countries, did they not? They colonized them, and then white became superior. That That's the reason why those countries are like that. I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's the case. I think it's always been, I mean, there's been different permutations of hatred and they've been focused on different things. So sometimes there's a more extreme focus on race and then, than other times, but there's always been a out group and it's usually been focused on you're a different ethnicity, you're a different, you know, uh, tribe than I am. You have a different language, a different religion. Um, now we're seeing a more modern permutation of that that's focused on racism, but it's always existed and definitely in the, I mean, the South Asian subcontinent has its own like whole history of problems, but a lot of them existed way, you know, prior to colonization by by the British. And then it it, it existed uh, when, you know, the Muslims came over and they set up their own hierarchy of, of Muslims at the top and 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 everybody else and and society reorganized around that. So I just feel like there's. Um, a human problem of tribalism, a human yes. problem of in-group, out-group. I mean, and one can even argue that it's never going to go away. We're just going to find a different out-group um, and a different in-group as, you know, we expand as a society. Maybe tomorrow won't be a race, but maybe, Sarah, you're right that it's something else. But so so I guess my 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 discomfort with this framing of it is that it places it as if this is some ultimate, some unique kind of hatred and it's worse than all the other hatreds. And it's, you know, it's the Uber. You're saying that, I mean, that those are words that you're saying. No. And by the way, I just got back from India five days ago and I can go on and on about India and South Asia, all of it, but I'm not, that's not why I'm here. Um, White supreme, I'm just speaking to White supremacy in America. Yes, white supremacy is the foundational, it is foundational in the US. I mean, the history of America is white people came here, white people committed genocide against indigenous people, stolen land, white people kidnapped 
and enslaved African people stolen labor. And it's been a rinse and repeat cycle of racism and xenophobia ever since Chinese Exclusion Act, Operation Wetback, Department of Homeland Security, Muslim bans. So yes, here and now, we are. This, that's why we, we thought we were coming here is to talk about here and now, not the Mughal Empire in, in South Asia. Many times. Sure. Like, but, but, but if you're just talking about the American history, you just said this country was founded on white supremacy. But if that's the case, then every country in the world is founded on one supremacy or the other, right? Is that what you're, that you, that you agree with that? It is. No, nobody, nobody, nobody would never argue. Of course, there's been, the oppression has, ex, oppression has, has in time, time and space. But Sarah, let me say something that, that I think you really need to internalize. 80 something percent of the people in the world are people of color, people that look like you and me and Syrah, while the people who lead the world look like Megan. That's white supremacy. That right there is white supremacy. Do you want to respond to that, Sarah? Or I have a I have a question. I mean, yeah, this is a different conversation. Oh, I have. I, I don't want to. I don't want to take over the conversation about this because I can't. <laughs> okay, let's. Maybe we should have another conversation with you, Sarah, at a different time. No, nobody takes Sarah away from from me. We are to go together. Okay, now wait. <laughs> let's just shift for a second. I want to talk about who the women are who who have who you have these dinners. Like, what is the tip? What's the demographic? Where do you sort of see them? Like socioeconomically, politically, um, because I, especially in seeing the film, I have to say I could not stand these women. Like if these were the white women, if all white women were like this and these were the only kind of white women I knew, I would hate them. (laughs) So like, where are they coming from? And I wonder how similar they are even actually to like white women just in your world friends of yours and people that you would interact with routinely? Um, First of all, let me make uh, something about the dinner. Uh, The director actually did a casting call and then they went through all the women that applied and they chose the people. For the film, you mean? For the film? Oh, oh, yes, for the film. So I think, you know, we had two people in there who voted for Trump. Three. I think there were three. Trump voters are not the people okay. who come to our dinners who self-identify. So I think that needs to be made okay. clear. Okay. Yeah, I was a little surprised by that because when, yeah. when I saw them raising their hands, I was like, well, what are you doing here? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. So there's less, is there less drama than in, in a normal dinner conversation or just about the same? It, it's about the same and it depends. You know, the thing about having honest conversations is, it, it goes all over the place. You know, you have people that get their feelings hurt. You have people who will uh, roll their eyes. You know, I, I call it the three Ds. What white women like to do when you talk about racism is deny, deflect, defend. You know, those are the three things that happen routinely. I would say that th- it's um, become less dramatic in mm-hmm. the past, like since George Floyd was murdered. I mean, mm-hmm. There's been a significant shift, I would say, in terms of white women coming humbly and honestly and really wanting to talk about this in a way that's not filled with crying. Sure, there's like um, the reflexive, you know, not me, not me. But, uh, you know, we've had like one great dinner we had last year in the New York City area where we, you know, asked everyone, um, can you talk about an instance where you have been racist? And the last woman woman who went was like, when you asked that question at the beginning, I thought, I'm why am I here? I shouldn't be here. And now that I've listened to the past seven people, I've done all of those things and I have my own list of things. And so one thing, like, look, I'm not here to argue with anybody. In fact, like I don't do media with people who can't even acknowledge that white supremacy is the foundational principle. So it's it's a little uncomfortable to even have an argument about that, to be honest with you, Sarah, number one. But um, 
this is not a put gotcha. Like at every, you, you see this in the movie, I talk about Asian anti-Blackness. We go into this in the book about that. Look at what just happened in the LA City Council with the Latinx folks, um, you know, being really overtly racist. This is not white people are bad and Black people and brown people are good. This is calling the system of oppression out for what it is and back to why it's important for white people to racialize themselves. If you don't do that, then you don't, you see yourself outside of the system. You see your, you don't see yourself as a player in the system. So what does that look like for me as a South Asian woman born and raised in the United States of America in the year 2023? It means that I'm on the receiving end of white supremacy and I am on the giving end of anti-Black racism. And frankly, de facto, because colorism and all these other things are involved, self-loathing. I can tell, I mean, I'm spending a lot of time um, talking with South Asians, uh, first generation South Asians. And when they're being, when we're being very honest, we will say that. I mean, I again, I just got back from India and every single ad, but for maybe three, were hyper exposed ads. So everybody yeah. looks white. We were talking everybody about looks this white. last time. I mean, yeah. it's it's really yeah, we were. that's white, that's white supremacy culture. So um, this is not. I mean, this is not like a it, people who perceive white guilt and white shame is the flip side, in my opinion. Of, of white pride and white nationalism, that doesn't get us anywhere. But for all of us to acknowledge, it's like men who don't acknowledge that that they are born and raised to be sexist. I'm raising a boy right now and a girl, a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old, and we are every day talking about male privilege. I see how they are both being socialized into the gender oppression. It's It doesn't make anyone bad. We've all been put through sausage factories, and when you were put through a sausage factory, you do, in fact, come out a sausage. That's all this is. And to be honest with you guys, like, Obviously, we're doing something pretty simple, but pretty radical, that it's getting so much attention and everyone has so many opinions when all we're saying is just be honest. I look at what my kids are learning in school. Why are we still having fake Thanksgivings in school? Do you, I mean, do we, do we ever have any real conversations about what happened to indigenous people in this country? No, we don't. Certainly not in school, but we have like celebrations of Thanksgiving. That's all we're saying. And I'm not sure why that's such a like, there's clearly there's got to be this super wedded to the norm and the status quo for people to have such a hard time wrapping their brains around just being honest about where we all sit in the power structure. I feel like we're having these conversations all the time. What you just laid out is intersectional theory framework. I mean, that's it's part of the it's part yeah. of the parlance yeah. among a certain educated classes. And it's certainly in, in, in the media and in elite circles, whatever you want to call it. This is the waters that we're swimming in right now. So that's why I was curious what kinds of women are coming to these dinners, because I it seems to me that we talk about what's happened to indigenous people all the time. I mean, every Thanksgiving for the last decade, at least that's a, that's a huge conversation, but it may be that there's just, you know, we are in our bubble of people obsessing about these things in a certain way and other people are clueless maybe. So. I think it's looking at schools. What is being taught in schools? That, that is always my sort of go-to like what are kids learning? Cause that's how we're all socialized. And I can tell you that what my kids are learning, it's literally the same thing that I was learning in 19, you know, 1980, um, wow. which is a bunch of lies. I mean, it's just a bunch of lies. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have a book series coming out this year called Race to the Truth series. Um, and it's a slew of kids books. And to our mind, um, it's coming out with Crown, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. It's the first commercial book series for kids about very raw, honest truth about what's happened in this country. Truth about history. 1619 yeah. Project, there, there's so much. Like, that's why, I mean, there's a moment in the film, Regina, where you say... That's one book, and it came out a couple years ago. That's one book. It's not an entire curriculum. Okay. Well, no, I mean, I'm not, but it's like that. It's a, it's a movement. I mean, uh, that's, it's been celebrated. But so there's a... Well, here, here's my thought on it. The movement doesn't work unless white people start telling the truth. You know, when and when I say telling the truth, I mean, it's got to be white people who are, you know, right now, I think you're going to see who's leading 
as we always have, Black people have always been on the forefront for liberation because we're at the bottom. We are at the bottom of everything in this country. So we have always, white people have got to step up and start carrying the burden for liberation for everybody. And I'm just curious, would Sarah and Megan, would you both say that white supremacy, like white people are not at the top and black people are not at the bottom? I'm just curious. I wouldn't frame it in terms of the the governing ideology of the United States as white supremacy. But I would say that uh, out of what is, what, is the, what is the governing ideology of the United States then? I think we have a mul- mul- multiple ideologies. We have, you know, values that we we sanctify, like like any country, you know, that we that we uh, hold dear. And some of that is yeah. playing pretend. But we've never lived up. We have never lived up to our values ever. Sure. So, but so th- what values do we sanctify? Sanctify as in we consider them very, very important. Now, whether or not we reach those values is a different question, right? I know what sanctify means. My question yeah. is what values? You said that we have, as a country, we have values that we sanctify. What are those values that we sanctify? Freedom of speech, freedom of association, equality, like equality be- among the sexes. And none of those things are true. I can, I can write things on a piece of paper. None of those things are true. An ideal doesn't, I mean, it doesn't disqualify an ideal. If I say my ideal is to be an honest person all the time, I'm not going to be honest 100% of the time. That then, then I can't say, oh, well, it's not true that it's my ideal. It's still my ideal. It's still what I'm going towards. Oh, wait, wait, Syra, go ahead. <laughs> it makes you a hypocrite. Well, no, it because you can't be, but you can't be perfect. But you can't, I mean, it, of course not. Wait, <laughs> but you can be a liar. You can be a hypocrite or a liar. Ideal is something you reach. An ideal is something you try to reach all the time. And of course, it's human to fail, right? There's no, where's the, who's, where's the society, where's, name one human society ever that has perfectly reached their ideal. And it's easy for you to say that because South Indian women are not getting murdered by police every day like Black people. So I, I think that a lot of, it's, it's very easy, Megan, to say that we're talking about this all the time. I mean, talk to a ton of indigenous people, and I don't think indigenous people think that we're talking about this all the time. The whole thing is put critical race theory, put yourself in the position, and it's different. Obviously, it's different in India because there's very few white people in India. There's casteism, there's Islamophobia out the wazoo. People hate Christians. Like there's there's different systems everywhere. But look at the most marginalized people in the society, uplift them, and then all boats rise. I think it's very strange to say that we have values that we sanctify when who are the found founding fathers? They were all slave owners. <laughs> Founding fathers, founding fuckers. They were white rapists and slave owners. So why do we even care, frankly, what they, what values they sanctified? And even if we're using that bizarre, okay, we whatever they said goes, we haven't upheld any of it. And to that's say right. that it doesn't matter, oh, Sarah, but that that's denying progress. Right? That's saying yeah. that progress is not real and it doesn't matter because Sarah, see, you can say that. But every week, not a week, not one week goes by in America where a black person is not murdered by police. Not one week, not one. And I was having this conversation and another black person said to me, not one day. I said, well, you know, I can't stand by that, but I can certainly say not one week. Okay. So, so, so your perspective is very different from mine because my people are on the bottom. We have always been on the bottom. We have always been lynching, murdered, stolen land, everything. So no, I don't see the progress you see. So that's what I'm saying, Regina. I feel like I, I hear you. I, I, I'm listening. I understand that, but I I saw this in the movie as, uh, as well. I watched it earlier a little bit today and some last night um, that you said something about, you know, there's MLK came and, you know, the people it. say that he changed, <laughs> people say that he changed everything, but nothing has changed. And I think that that's, that's absurd to say that nothing has changed. So much has changed. Okay. Let me tell you what, 
Sarah, let, here's what you need to know. Now, I was born in 1950, so I watched the whole civil rights movement, okay? Okay. What happened? You know who the beneficiaries were of the civil rights movement? White women. White women have progressed more in this country from the backs of black people than any other group. You know who the leading people are in DEI? 86% of the, okay, but that's across the board. That's in every case, in every institution. So our deaths, our labor, our lynchings, our murders have profited white women. So do the fucking work. Give back. Yes. What does that mean to you? Give back. What is that like in practical terms? Start, start talking. When you see shit, when you see shit, you need to pretend like these black kids are your kids. Okay. And raise your voice. Let your representatives know that it's not okay that black kids, there was a 12 year old murdered by a white man a couple of weeks ago, and he's out of jail now. Where's your voice? 12 years old. Finish this this thought if you want, but I'm more like, um, I, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot. I, I, do, I do think, I actually see this, Sarah and I are a little bit different here because I do think that white people run, that we do, w- w- whether you want to call it a white supremacy or anything else, white people are in charge in the West, in the U.S., and have been for a long time. I think it's slowly starting to change. But it's, Sarah, it's interesting to me. So yeah, but see, but so Regina, there was a moment in the film where you said nothing has changed for 500 years. And that sounds hyperbolic, but are you actually suggesting literally that you mean that? How could you mean that? Well, I think for black people, okay, you're, we're not being lynched now, but we are certainly being imprisoned. We are certainly being murdered by police. So, you know, however you want to look at it, the violence against black people, just because the color of our skin has not changed. But it's changed radically. It has not changed. It's changed radically. No, it hasn't. Yeah. I'm talking about violence against black bodies. Yeah. It has not changed. The industrial prison, okay? Who, look who's in prison. Who's in prison? Okay, but that's... Go ahead, Sarah. It, it feels like there's a conflation of a lot of different things. And no, I agree with you, Regina, that... that, that... What is the conflation? What are the conflation of a lot of different things? So the, the, for the... the, the the prison complex problem, right? Like there's a lot that's, that's to do with the drug war more than it is a lot of other things. Right. And the- do you know the history of police and prisons? Like, do, are you aware of that? You say that I want to, I also want to go back, stop. You've, you've talked a lot, Sarah, um, <laughs> go back to values and the sanctity. Okay. I, I, I think the issue here, and I just did a quick Google. So you're an ex Muslim of North America. Wokeness got into your, act, in, in your <laughs> oh, activism. No. I think that we're like foundationally just different here. And I guess my question is, there have only been two other, and we've done a ton of media, two other podcasts that I've been on where I have felt like it's not even worth having the conversation. One was with an actual white Nazi in the UK. One was with two white Jewish women in New York. And one is this. And I'll tell you why. If we're actually starting from a place um, and I know I didn't re- like I didn't realize that you were like a hard right person. It sounds like you are. Um, oh my god! I didn't what I didn't realize that. I am not. <laughs> okay. None of us realize that. Okay, well, so um, disagreeing with you cannot be hard right. Yeah. You cannot define it that way. I th- no no no. Anyone could. Di- I-, I could care less if you disagree with me on a bunch of things. But if you disagree that white supremacy is the foundational part of America. There's really nothing to talk about. And that's okay. Like, I think that it's okay to say, like, if you actually think that like black people are not getting shit on every single second of every. That's two, that's two different things. That's, that's not what I said. And that's not what I think. That's not, you're conflating it. That's what I'm saying. You're saying 
And number three, if you think that things have radically changed and that you too can look at a black woman in the face, Regina Jackson, and question her truth as if you both know black people's truth more than an actual black woman, there's nothing to talk about. Who are we? Who are the three of us to question Regina Jackson's truth as a black woman? We are not black women. We don't even... But it's objective reality that nothing has changed in 500 years. Megan, Megan, would you agree that the largest uh, gains since the civil rights movement have gone to white women? Will you agree to that? You understand the numbers and the data around that. It's really easy. Yeah, that, but that I can I can acknowledge that that's true while also saying that it is patently untrue that nothing has changed in 500 years. I mean, these are what has changed. Tell us, tell me. I said the violence against black bodies has not changed. What's changed about it is the way it happens. Instead Megan, of why lynchings you tell us now, it's mind. mass incarceration. It's police murders. Okay. That's violence against Black people on a daily basis. I mean, okay, well, on an on an abstract level, I, I'm following your logic. But see, this is, I mean, we wanted to have you on because it's what you're, there's a lot of what you're saying that makes perfect sense, that, that's obvious. But there's also so much around this that I, I'm, I'm curious how this is actually helping anybody make any progress because for instance like there's a lot of and i don't i don't know if this is sort of like a stylistic or sort of rhetorical choice but there's moments in the book where you talk about white women are um always stabbing each other in the back so there's this i mean just shift a little bit let's move a slightly lighter lighter area here but like there's a moment where you're talking about sitting down next to a table of white women and they're all kind of gossiping and they've gotten together and it's like the minute one of them gets up to go to the ladies' room, they start talking shit about her. And and it's sort of like, this is how white women are. How can you do this to yourselves, ladies? You're always stabbing each other in the back. This is how you carry on. I mean, first of all, the scene was really over the top. I have never seen anybody do that. If you're going to stab your friend in the back, it's not when she's going to go to the ladies' room. It's going to be later with the other friend over the phone. But are you really suggesting that women of color don't act like that? Well, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, when I when I talked about that and I've talked to that with white women and I say, do you guys really do that? I mean, do you really do that? But do you not? A, a no, not to that extent. And do you not do that? That's to me. That's racist. No, it's racist no, to say that no. you as you, I don't in my well, I don't, friends. I'm not a gossip. I don't stab people in the back. Like I say, I don't need your back to talk about you. I will talk about you to your face. But do you think that all women do that? My friends don't talk that way either. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Megan, I can mm -hmm. tell you, I used to be a white woman. I mean, I was a University of Virginia sorority white woman. So what's funny about you saying that is I would say that's the one thing at every dinner when we say at the end, who do you all hate more than you hate the two of us right now? And there's very quickly, at least one will raise their hand and be like, oh my God, each other. And that's, that's such a, that's just, that's just a, that's a platitude. But that, that's narcissism of small differences. That's a human thing. That's a human thing. These are the women who are also saying, let's choose love and, and everybody bleeds red. These are just, this is, these are banalities. You just asked me a question that I'm answering and you're arguing with the anecdotal evidence that we're telling you. Okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that those particular women didn't say that, but that's. Number two. Yes. Other not people. Not representative. Other, you really okay. think you, that you white talk, women, what? you really think that white women. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything because every time I open my mouth, you interrupt. So you guys should. That's how our podcast is. I, Sarah and I interrupt each other all the time. Great. So you should talk to each other. Okay. You know, okay. I don't care about you guys interrupting <laughs> me, but what I need you to acknowledge is that violence against black people is horrific in this country. Horrific. Sure. Yes. We have no problem acknowledging and, that. We have and 
white people are the ones who have to stop it. You have to use your voice. You have to use your political power. You have to use your money to stop it. Okay, so I know we're running out of time, but so what would that look like? When you say that white people need to use their voice, speak up in a situation where there's an injustice occurring right in front of them, what would that look like? That looks like the same things black people do, okay? We we contact our legislators, okay? We propose legislation. We talk to our Congress people. We spend our money on groups that are the Equal Justice Initiative, you know, on groups who are legitimately fighting this. That's what white people have to do. But in the moment, okay, but I thought you were talking about in the moment, if somebody is being terrible to somebody. I mean, yeah, use your voice, use your voice. Say, you know what? This is, I have had to stop white nonsense with 10 white people standing there, like that pretending like they didn't see it. And I don't have a problem doing that, but you guys need to stop up, step up and do that. Okay. So there's also a moment where I don't know again, if this is like a joke or hyperbolic. So I think this is in the film. You talk about white women being late. Like, first of all, that we say kisses all the time and that we're late. And so, like, for example, is that something that are you're, you're serious about? Because it's funny because we also talk about punctuality being like part of white supremacy. And I don't take I, I personally do not take that seriously. But like, how do you I'm just trying to figure out like how you put all these pieces together. How serious are you about that? That white women are always late. I don't think Cyrus talking. And <laughs> well, then you can answer. I mean, I'm just curious because Sarah and I were. T- Go ahead. I I can honestly say I have very few white women friends. You know, uh, very few, and certainly on a very close level. Because remember, again, I'm a 72 year old black woman. Woman. When I was growing up, we didn't mingle. You know, we all stayed separate. We stayed in our places. It was not a mix to society. It was black and white. Asians almost didn't even exist. Megan, you know what I would ask you is to come to one of our dinners. It sounds like your feelings are really hurt about being ridiculed. My feelings are, no, I don't take it personally at all, but my feelings are very hard to hurt, but I'm... And you do, you do that. Sadly, with the video, I can see that it bothers you (laughs) that we would point out these flaws when literally every piece of media about, you know, people with Indian accents are jokes. We're terrorists or we own 7-Elevens or we're jokes, right? Like it's, it's Black, Asian, Latino people in media are jokes. White people are always the, you know, the the protagonists. We're always the wingmen to the white women in movies and in romantic comedies, always. You know what I think bothers people so much, white people so much, and 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 their sidekicks, their black and brown sidekicks so much? <laughs> Am I the sidekick? Oh my God, she's my sidekick? Okay. You're experiencing a little fraction of having a mirror held up to you, and that really hurts. And we, I can see it, Megan, that really hurts you. My goodness, we point out that your, your society relies on backstabbing. And you asked a question before, yes, a, I can speak to Asians, we do it too, but because we are white aspirational, that's called internalized whiteness. Black and brown people uphold white supremacy every single day. We learn from you, we watch soap operas, we watch Friends, we watch Seinfeld because there's nothing else to watch. So we try to emulate your behavior. Oh my gosh. Are you really? There's nothing else to watch after all this time. And also, just by the way, I would actually love to come to a dinner. So I may take you up on that. However, I'm talking to you as an author. You have authored a book. It's published. It's on the bestseller list. You were edited. You were fact-checked. I'm just curious how you arrived at these examples. I'm talking to you as a professional to another professional. I was a white woman for 42 years. I went to the, I was in a book club with Chelsea Clinton. I have been in a lot of rooms with a lot of white people and lots of, I used to work in London and lots of parts of the world. 
that like this is stuff that I have actually experienced. We have dinners with white women for a living. We do this. This happens. This happens. You saw the movie. You saw how women acted. And just because you hated them, you're trying to distance yourself. You're just, oh, I didn't like the way they acted. So I, they, I hated them. Really? You don't see any, any. Well, they said things that if I heard, if I heard women say, if I heard somebody say everybody bleeds red, I would be appalled. And I would say, you are clueless. I, I, that, that's just. I'm glad to hear that. So wait, 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 but wait, I think what, what, what she's reacting to is that, and I think that this is what is hard to swallow about not every single thing that you're saying, like you guys are saying certain things like, you know, black people are suffering horribly in this country. We agree. I agree. Megan agrees. Like that's not, they're not, those are not the points of disagreement. It's the way that this is being framed and the approach moving forward. Like, so let me, so let me talk, let me, let me give you the example because ju just this, what is that? What is that way? What is the way it took way? Just this right here, just this conversation where, you know, you're taking something about white women uh, that you heard from a few white women, you had that personal experience. Okay. And then you are, you are behaving in the way that racists behave by saying that this is what white people do. This is what white women are. And if you disagree, you're just uncomfortable with a truth and a reality, but that's, that is literal racism. You don't understand power though. That's racism. I can't be racist against white people. I can be racist against Regina, but I can't be racist against white people because racism relies Requires on power. power. And I don't have any power over white people. I can be prejudiced. I can be prejudiced. And I can't be racist. I get that. That's intersectionality. That's fine. But I still think it's racist. I think that we're all, don't you think that it's, racist. we're all racist, we're all sexist, we're all ageist, we're all ableist. No. I mean, we can no. work against it. You no. don't think that. You like you don't. No, here's here, here's what I know. I do agree with that. I do agree with that, Megan. As white people, unless you are actively, and when I say actively, and again, my biggest ask is, open your fucking mouth when you see shit. Okay, unless you're actively anti-racist, you are racist. Wait, Megan, I agree with you. I agree with, and I, I do have to go because I've got another podcast, but um, yes, all of us are sex, in, in, inter, like there's internalized misogyny, I, but I, I can't be racist against you. I would argue everybody is, is, is anti-Black just because of the power structure. So depending where you lay on the power structure, yes, all of us are ableist. All of us are homophobic. All of us are transphobic because that's the status quo. And it's being aware of that and actively dismantling it every day. So I would be a hypocrite. I, I, I would be a hypocrite if I come on here and say that all white people are racist but but then that you know all cis people are not transphobic. Yes, all cis people are transphobic because that is the status quo. Like that is the status quo. So I agree with that, Megan. I actually have to go. I got to hop, guys. Sorry. Okay. Well, thank you for sure. coming on. I really appreciate it. Okay. Oh, Regina, do you want to? We're not going <laughs> to. Yes, yeah, still tough. But uh, Regina, still. Here. Megan, where are you actually located? I'm in California and Sarah's uh, in outside of Washington, D.C. OK. All right. OK, well, I will have uh, send me an email and I'll have Lisa get in touch with you. We are actually doing uh, a couple of things out in California in March. We're doing a um, a screening of Deconstructing Karen and a talk back. OK. OK. And we've got a dinner plan. So. OK. I'd love to hear about it. All right. Sarah's not invited, okay. though, right? It's only, it's only white women. Well, she's in D.C. Uh, uh, right. But she can't come because she's not white. Well, can there, can there be one that for, for, for people like <laughs> me, the sidekicks of white women? No, actually, when, when Lisa had her dinner, she had a uh, East Asian woman there and what happened is all the white, every time we would say something, all the white women would pivot to her, you know, expecting her to. So we don't want to put anybody in that position. We decided okay, we okay. wouldn't do that anymore. But okay. Syra is working, like she said, on her own community. So there may be all some right. opportunities okay. there. <laughs>
All right. Okay. okay. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye out. But thank you so much, Regina. We appreciate it. You guys are sports. You're welcome. Yeah, I apologize again for the technical <laughs> stuff. That was uh, no yeah. issues. You know, it's real hard to hurt my feelings because I actually don't give an F. So we can see. We yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Neither do we. Okay. Good. Okay. okay. Talk to you soon. Have a good week. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right, Sarah. How are you feeling about this post interview? Well, it's been a week since we recorded it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I wish I had gotten more directly involved. In, there were some things that I disagreed with with Sarah and um, that she was bringing up that I wish I had said something about. Um, but overall, I thought it was I thought it was good given the amount, given the time constraints. I think we did a good job. And they did a good job, actually. Um, mm-hmm. Their book, I don't know, I found it very easy to deconstruct, to break down the arguments in the book. Um, but speaking to them, I feel like uh, it, it, they were much more personable and eloquent. So it's that's interesting because normally in book form, people come across a lot more eloquent than they are in real <laughs> right. life. Certainly I do. I know I do. Um uh, but but they they did a good job. Mm-hmm. What did you think? Yeah, I thought they were they were very personable and um, and charismatic actually. And you know, the the movie itself, the deconstructing Karen movie. I thought it was really interesting that um, Regina explained that that was actually cast. So the women that were in the movie, they were that was not like a, a dinner party that had arisen organically. Those were women who were put in the film mm-hmm. uh, for various reasons. And it definitely had like a like a real housewives kind of quality, just the aesthetic of it and the reaction shots. And so I think that the movie actually may not give the dinners themselves a fair shake, yeah. ironically enough, because yeah. it's very easy to get really frustrated with with the women in the film and it may be that in real life the the women who go are um a little more uh substantive and interesting yeah yeah i i mean it's just so out of it, it it's hard to even know where to begin because i disagree with so much of their worldview and their values that you don't even i mean can we should we just go you know bit by bit through the interview and break it down or what like what how do we how do we even move forward and and comment on this i think the people who've been listening to us will already know what we're kind of going to say about it um but let's discuss it in the the post for the for the paying subscribers Okay. Yes, that should be an enticement. But um, yeah, just just so you know, if there's any, I'm sure you guys were screaming at your at your phones or your listening devices as you were listening or, or watching, and there's there's nothing you were thinking that we weren't thinking. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot that we could have stopped and say, okay, let's question that. Like, let's what you know, they were making statements of fact about things. Um, that I wanted to dispute, but then I thought in the moment that if we go down this rabbit hole, we'll never right. we'll never come out. Yeah, I think we can agree that yeah. it's not true that nothing has changed in four hundred years. We 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 did talk about that just a little bit, but there was yeah. you know there was the there there was a lot about you know violence on in on black bodies and that kind of thing. And again, not to deny that it's happening, but yeah, we'll go yeah. into it. Okay, all right. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, until next time, see you in hell. See you in hell. Hi, it's Megan from A Special Place in Hell. If you enjoy the show and want to support it, there are a couple of ways you can do that. The first is to join our Substack at aspecialplace.substack.com. There you can get access to bonus content every week. You can participate in listener comment threads, and you can even join us for Zoom Hangouts, where we get together and talk about the show and answer all of your questions. You can also rate and review the show wherever you get your podcasts, including on our new YouTube channel, which is called A Special Place in Hell. Sarah and I are really excited about the future of the podcast, and we're so grateful to have you along with us. So thanks for listening, and we will see you in hell.